administration have been. You can chalk it up for a number of reasons. I've seen many commentators think that there was, among other things, a lack of planning and prescience by the incoming team. Perhaps no one was more surprised that Trump was president than the president himself. But in the end, uh, we've had a very rocky start. Before talking about the policymaking climate, I would like to go through some graphics that I think are useful for an international audience to understand where Trump as part of this global populist movement or parallel populisms came from. You've probably all seen a map that looks something like this. This is a conventional electoral college map, plucking out the blue states that uh, are few and far between, but those where Hillary picked up the electoral votes versus the many other red states. Now, you look at the blue, you look at the red, you think, I understand how the Electoral College went Republican. But the funny thing is, again, the popular vote, there were more votes won through these blue states. Here's another way to look at it. Counties. Within the American states, uh, most, they're mostly divided into counties, districts, parishes, and these are the counties, blue and red, blue where Hillary Clinton took the majority vote, red where uh, Trump took the majority. And what you see in this image is a small scattering of deep blue dots where the major metropolises, the major uh, tech and development areas of the U.S. are sitting in a sea of suburban and rural red. Now here's another view. The red are counties where Trump got 70% or more of the vote, the blue, where Hillary got 70% or more. But there's just a small fringe of purple counties where uh, one or the other actually won, but it was a much more divided context. And you can see where they concentrated uh, in those Rust Belt states and in Florida, the states in play that ultimately determined the election. Another view replaces that standard with a spectrum. And the more purple represents the more evenly contested communities. You see the pockets of deep blue, you see the pockets of deep red, and then you see the divided communities in the states. And this is my favorite image. You do not need to check your glasses. You do not need to doubt whether or not I fail geography, which is typically a good concern with an American. Um, this was generated by assigning to each one of the counties a resized dot relevant or relative to actual population. So you see explosions of a few key areas in the middle of the country and the small, sparse red communities holding it together. So it's clearly a polity divided. But this is one of the last numbers that has caught my eye just reading through all of the analysis, which is where in the American economy did support go for the two candidates? And this is striking. If you look at those counties where Hillary Clinton won, she only won 472 counties compared to Trump having over 2,500 counties. But her counties accounted for 64% of America's GDP compared to 36% for Trump. What does that tell you? It's telling you that not just urban areas, but areas that are the focal points for innovation, the focal points for connectivity with the rest of the world, those were the communities that tended to vote Democratic, and then yeah, the rest went the other way. So now I had to turn to the question before looking at what international companies need to be thinking of and uh, worrying about going forward. The question of um, how do we describe the policy-making environment? And I was looking for a metaphor, and the best metaphor I could come up with is a circus. A festival, uh, a spectacle that defies imagination, with lots of things happening, and unfortunately, for better or worse, everyone in the world is a captive member of the audience of this show. I don't need to make fun of it, but this is my actual experience, a lot of other American expats. We wake up in the morning in Asia to see what's the news, <coughs> what, what has been tweeted, what has happened overnight, to see what uh, new information has come in. Um, I was looking for an image to capture this, and sometimes 
when you're doing a PowerPoint presentation, the perfect image comes in. This montage of circus imagery of what Trump's role in the circus is. If you watch Fox News, if you watch CNN, if you walk, listen to Pacifica, if you listen to MSNBC, NPR, anywhere across the spectrum, and my, you know, people I know of all political persuasions, you'll find different, there's broad agreement that this is an unprecedented time, but a lot of disagreement over how they're gonna cast the characters. There are those who would view Trump as living up to his uh, campaign promises. He's the strong man, draining the swamp, challenging orthodoxies. There's those who would view him as the clown, the buffoon, amateur hour, a team that was not ready to govern and are inflicting the system and in the global political and economic systems. There's some that would view him as the magician, the lifelong developer and entertainment magnate who has somehow found a way to convert that popularity into the presidency. Uh, it, it, it's at a certain level, to be where he is, all three must have been at play, but it's a very daunting time. Second, tensions between the agenda that got him there and the party that he now purportedly leads. Uh, the Republicans tending to be right of center, uh, much more uh, libertine on economics, on uh, domestic financial and uh, social policy versus the populism that he appealed to. America first, only America, those sort of, those sort of refrains. And that can be viewed uh, in some ways as the big tent. Not everybody who elected Trump fits within his tent, and we're starting to see those fissures in various areas of policy. Next image, multiple Republican parties. This is the elephant, the image of the Republican Party on uh, their emblem for many decades, uh, balancing on a ball. The tensions within the Republican Party between the traditional policy elites, many of whom uh, were diametrically opposed to his nomination, uh, many of whom publicly flipped sides and supported uh, Clinton, many of whom now in Congress are being increasingly vocal mavericks. How do they then balance their view of the direction of Republican? much less frictions with the Democrats. I couldn't resist. I needed the icon of trained dancing bears for the next one. No honeymoon, bitterness and scandals. We've been shocked, uh, if you're following the US press, the extent to which questions about the role of possible com uh, communications between Trump, Trump proxies, the Trump campaign, and the Russians in the course of the election and thereafter is a staggering scandal, the sort that very few could have imagined before this period in time. And it continues to impair the effectiveness of the government on many fronts, you know, let alone the underlying concerns it raises. The roles of the media. This is, I'm gonna use the popcorn machine as the uh, icon here. The media, it, um, particularly in, later in the election and since this election, has been much more visibly partisan. Uh, and the roles that traditional media, that blogs, uh, that some very, uh, and that very sources of information are playing in not just where the public and voters are getting their information, but apparently where the government, where Trump and his team is getting their information, is unprecedented and worrying. The frequency with which the, the tweets coming from the president are actually retweeting uh, comments from third parties for views on the world. That's an alarming development. Now, an institutional issue: <coughs> the executive branch. With Trump coming in, arguably more to the wings on either side than any president of recent memory, we've seen unprecedented conduct like that within the executive branch. There are many more vacancies at senior levels than there have been in the past. There are, uh, the vacancies and lack of policy direction is making it difficult for US foreign policy and domestic policy institutions to move forward. And it's also making it very difficult for uh, other countries to interact effectively with the US. The questions of even how some of the current leaders interact with uh, Trump and his team in the White House. Finally, the electoral cycle, the Ferris wheel. In two years, 
All of Congress is up for re-election, uh, sorry, all of the House of Representatives is up for re-election. They're all in two-year terms. A third of the senators are up for re-election. Most conventional crystal balls will say that uh, a number of those seats are returning incumbents, which are historically fairly, fairly secure, but if the approval ratings of the president remain in the 30% range and other scandals uh, continue to percolate, we may actually see a switch in Congress, which could have very significant uh, implications. Um, again, most think that's unlikely to happen, uh, but just see how the overall political mood in the US uh, is going. Importantly, though, this is an hourglass going down. It's a deadline. The first two years of the administration with the White House and both houses of Congress are the greatest opportunity for the Republicans to get legislative changes through. That's important, because as we turn to the topic of today's discussion, what does this really mean for international companies? These are subsidiary rings of the three-ring, four-ring circus. There's a lot that can be done and may occur in technocratic ways uh, that are not really drawing the same media attention that uh, other elements of American politics are right now. And so we're, as companies that are worried about the opportunities and the risks of U US regulatory enforcement, don't be looking necessarily at the first page of the papers. Be watching what's going on in subsidiary later pages. So let's start with the FCPA. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, for, com for international companies, this and the other OECD extraterritorial anti-bribery statutes have emerged as a very significant compliance risk and a high priority to be managed. What did citizen Trump say back in 2012 before anybody thought he was a meaningful candidate for president? In the middle of 2012, uh, he was a routine commentator on cable MSNBC on the business news. They actually called it Trump Tuesday. He'd routinely dial in for 15, 20 minutes and interact by phone with the other members of their panel. And there was this, you can go listen to it, there was about a 20 minute segment in the middle of May. Key topic number one was the uh, uh, J.P. Morgan Investments the, and the London Whale, where that went. Key topic number two, the prenuptial agreement of Mark Zuckerberg and whether or not he was going to enter that with his wife before they got married, before the, the uh, IPO. And last, Walmart and the FCPA matters that Walmart was facing in Mexico and elsewhere. And commenting on that, this is what citizen Trump said, and I won't try to imitate the voice. <laughs> Look, I know a lot about Mexico, and Mexico is a mess, and this country is absolutely crazy. They prosecute people for going over to China and Mexico and other countries and getting business and creating jobs in this country, meaning the U.S., because we do make some product that goes out, but I see them prosecuting all the time. Let Mexico or let China or let these other countries prosecute. What are we, pro uh, what are we prosecute, prosecuting people to keep China honest? Now every other country goes into these places and they do what they have to do. It's a horrible law and it should be changed. I mean, we're like the policemen of the world. It's ridiculous. That's what citizen Trump said. And he said it in a more entertaining voice. <laughs> Fast forward to Jeff Sessions in his nomination cycle to become attorney general. What did you, Senator Sessions former prosecutor, uh, longtime Alabama senator, say, in response to an inquiry from one of the senators uh, that includes a great preface, President Trump has called the FCPA a terrible law. It is law. the cornerstone of federal efforts to prevent and prosecute bribery of foreign officials by U.S. corporations, and to maintain a fair and level playing field for small and mid-sized corporations doing business overseas. Since 2008, the federal government, the DOJ, SEC, and FBI have maintained about 150 active investments at any given time, resulting in $1.56 billion in funds. Continued vigorous enforcement of the FCPA and the International Anti-Bribery Act of 1998. A trenchant response. Yes. If confirmed as Attorney General, I will enforce all federal laws, including the FCPA, as appropriate based on the facts and circumstances of each case. 
not a ringing endorsement of the policy behind FCPA enforcement, but a rote commitment to enforce congressional intent. So now, uh, there were a number of media articles right around election time that suggested a wholesale retreat from FCPA enforcement. I don't think that's going to happen. But what may happen as uh, Trump appointees take control within the Department of Justice under Sessions and also at the SEC um, with, the, uh, with the nomination of um, SNC partner Jay Clayton to become the new head is a recalibration of priorities and the intensity of enforcement. Number one, there may be fewer resources committed to FCP and PA enforcement than in the past. Number two, the SEC for the last eight years or so has been pursuing an enforcement policy called broken windows, inspired, ironically, by Trump supporter Rudy Giuliani's tenure running uh, uh, as a prosecutor in New York. The theory being, if you go after any small infraction, zero tolerance for broken windows and minor vandalism, that over time, where the SEC quite frequently was bringing enforcement actions in areas where the DOJ was not acting, making a settlement at relatively nominal sums, often using administrative procedure, that was broken windows. Given, uh, in particular, Jay Clayton's emphasis on getting our markets going again, making them be more attractive to investors, we're likely to see a reduction in the, the intensity of enforcement on that front. Um, other areas, the DOJ is likely to uh, pare back some of its more aggressive enforcement theories in jurisdiction. The Yates memo, which saw and called for a, a greater enforcement focusing on individual culpability, is likely to remain in place. Uh, the pilot program that the DOJ introduced for encouraging companies to voluntarily disclose violations also likely to be in place. <coughs> But this is an area where both agencies are probably going to be less aggressive in investigation um, when it comes to the burdens they impose on companies in broadening investigation scope and in the tenor they take in settlement negotiations. But there are questions here. To what extent will diplomatic gaps impair what has been fairly effective international cooperation with their peers on a lot of fronts? Will the kleptocracy recovery initiative using American money laundering rules to recover cash taken from other countries and giving it back to those governments, will the Trump administration have the same appetite for that discretionary program? And the Dodd-Frank whistleblower program, um, to, although there's a lot of criticism of Dodd-Frank, will that remain in place? One thing we may see, it, given uh, the alignment of parties in Congress, is an effort to make some minor technical changes to the FCPA. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce, a number of years ago, advanced some uh, proposals for reform. Some were clarifications on the U.K. Bribery Act. In the current uh, climate, if we ever get around to those types of proposals may come forward. But to be clear, uh, for MNCs operating internationally, operating in India, do not assume that the FCPA is going away. The statute of limitations is shorter than an American electoral cycle, and there is a huge commitment within the DOJ and the SEC at the working levels to seeing this program through for a variety of policy, principled, and other reasons. Second area to talk about quickly is antitrust. Um, there are two federal antitrust agencies, the Department of Justice and the, with the Antitrust Division and the Federal Trade Commission. That's an accident of history, but it means that there are two bodies that push forward American antitrust policy. In, it's worth noting that there are also state attorney generals that can be involved in federal antitrust enforcement and state antitrust law enforcement, and that's not been impacted by the federal elections. That's all at the local level, I'm sorry, at the state level. Now, at the FTC, Trump can leave a real mark. The FTC is a federal commission. There's five commissioners. Uh, only three can be from the same party. And the uh, president gets to designate the chair. Let's look at who's there. First of all, 
Commissioner Maureen Allhausen, a, who's been a commissioner for um, since 2012. Her, uh, um, so her tenure is going to end in 2019. Trump very recently nominated her, her to be the acting chair. She may become the permanent chair. Or she's a Republican, uh, comes from University of Virginia, George Mason Law, conservative L&E approach to antitrust, uh, but has been in the government for a long time, and that was actually a pretty uh, reassuring sign of continuity. Next, Terrell McSweeney, antitrust lawyer at the DOJ, at the FTC. We were actually associates together uh, when I started my career. Um, and uh, she's a longtime aide affiliated with Joe Biden. She's Democrat. So there's one Republican, one Democrat. Let's look at the rest of the committee. Three vacancies. So Trump will have, now to get these confirmed, they do need Senate confirmation. But as long as the Republicans have the Senate, there is an opportunity to put, on one hand, Republican, um, and on the other hand, Democrats who are acceptable to that Republican majority Senate to populate the FTC and leave a mark on antitrust policy. So what may this mean for the rest of us and for the direction of antitrust? This is an area where I actually think we're probably going to see less uh, explosive populism and something that looks a bit more like what you would have expected it had there been a, um, an election by a more mainstream Republican candidate. Um, a couple, of, for example, a, a Jeb Bush or someone like that. First of all, cartels, uh, number one impact for international players. Cartel enforcement is, to a Republican antitrust lawyer, the ultimate goal of antitrust law, and continued extraterritorial enforcement will be a priority. There are already indications that there may be an uptick that uh, even after the transition in leadership, some of the international cartel investigations are continuing. Expect that to continue. Where do you expect to see changes philosophically? In non-cartel enforcement, in abuse of dominance, in horizontal collaborations, areas where uh, Republican antitrust theorists are more likely to be taking an A uh, a market-friendly approach and be more solicitous of the company. So expect fewer uh, interventions in U.S. Sherman Act Section 2 type cases, which are like European abuse of dominance cases. In the merger world, likewise, expect a greater focus on empirical evidence, uh, on uh, economic models that are clearly tied to upward pricing and uh, upward pressures on pricing as evidence of likely anti-competitive harm. In recent years, there has been a willingness of the federal authorities to intervene in cases where, uh, for example, innovation competition, some other things were perhaps more speculative looking down the road. That's less likely to be appealing under these uh, under a Trump administration. Uh, Commissioner Olhausen notably had gave a speech about a year ago on regulatory humility, on skepticism of the ability of regulators to have enough information to make complex decisions prospectively, and that will likely influence an Olhausen-led FTC. Um, the FTC may go after state-level barriers to entry, licensing for hairstylists and things like that, as a matter of policy advocacy where uh, the Constitution doesn't actually allow them to take action directly. There could be some reforms to keep an eye out for. One is a statute called the Standard Merger and Acquisition Reviews Through Equal Rules, or Smarter Act. Uh, this got through Congress in, uh, I'm sorry, through the House in 2015, but it was dropped in the face of White House uh, opposition and an inevitable veto. This would basically make the FTC apply the same procedures and standards that the DOJ does in merger review. Right now, if your deal goes to the FTC, you, have, uh, you face an agency that has a lower threshold showing to enjoin your merger, and they can go to their own administrative court to take action. Uh, it's not the same if the DOJ is looking at the deal. So th this is an effort to basically make uh, the standards the same regardless of which agency is reviewing a merger. There may also be an effort to 
uh, reinforce or expand the investment only exemption for HSR filings. That's been, there's been some pushback on what is really passive investment, investment only. If a uh, hedge, if a, uh, for example, a fund, a PE fund gets involved and is endeavoring to learn more, be active in the, uh, in promoting sales or investments in a company, there have been challenges to whether or not that ceases to be investment only. There may, may, may be some changes there. Uh, question mark, though, is international antitrust. That has been a focal point for a number of the Republican leaders of past antitrust agencies, uh, Bill Kovacic, uh, Tim Muris among them. Uh, that's where the populism and relative isolationism of a Trump White House flies in the face of the commitments to capacity building, harmonization, collaboration between competition agencies around the world. So let's see, going into the future, whether or not there's tension between the White House and the Republican stalwarts leading these agencies on internationalism. Olhausen has been very active at the FTC in outreach to China, to India, and others. Uh, and the nominee at uh, the DOJ, um, Del Rahim, likewise, he started out at the USTR doing IP issues. So there's hope for further engagement, at least in that pocket of the administration. The final slide, just wanted to highlight areas to keep in mind that are where the rubber will really hit the road, the real conflict between the constituencies in the Trump tent, the populists and the more classic market Republicans. And that's international trade and investment. With respect to multilateral treaties, I gotta say, it was surreal seeing a world last year where a Republican nominee was opposing the TPP, multilateral trade agreements, where the Democrat White House incumbent was ad actively advocating for it, the Republicans in, on Congress were supporting it, uh, and the Democratic nominee who had helped supervise its negotiation was opposing it. This is the TPP. Um, this is an area where be ready to watch sparks fly. I, I think, you know, frankly, uh, the U.S. made a grievous error with the step away from TPP, but we're going to have to see how that shakes out because, as you all know, there are many alternate plans for trade integration in this part of the world, and they're going to go forward. Uh, trade remedy is an area. These are anti-dumping duties, anti-subsidy duties, safeguards, where a very aggressive uh, International Trade Administration component of the Commerce Department is likely to be even more aggressive under a Trump administration than they have been in the past. Uh, that tends to hit Chinese and Vietnamese exporters fairly uniquely hard, but that will likely continue. Uh, and then in the area of foreign direct investment into the U.S., CFIUS, which is the uh, Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S., which is supposed to examine transactions resulting in foreign control of U.S. business for the impact on national security broadly defined. That's going to be a point of schizophrenia for the White House. On one hand, a desire to promote investment in business, but on the other hand, a, uh, a very sensitive and broad view of what a security threat is and who the security threats might be. So that's an area where sovereign wealth funds and all other foreign investors may find it uh, wise to continue tacking away from control transactions as they look for U.S. opportunities. Sanctions and export control, regrettably that's something that just has to be watched closely. Those are instruments of American foreign policy masquerading as commercial policy, so changes in White House direction can dramatically impact those areas.